that it's time for another Chandler story. So, uh, two weeks ago, well, last week was Dia de Padre, right, Father's Day, and the week before that, I wasn't here, I was in Miami, so I missed you guys. So I figured since I missed it, I owe you a story. So we're in Miami, so there I was. Oh, nice, there. And uh, <laughs> a little background music to it. And we're on a family trip. What better way to start a family trip to Miami is to go to a baseball game. So for those of you who don't know, that's Kathy, my wife, and the ones in the shades, Aiden and Cole, they kind of interchange depending on which one you yell at first. So we're on our way to a baseball game, happy family, good times. And her aunt got us these wicked awesome seats, like right on the first baseline. I mean, we're like right there. So here we are enjoying the game. It's a Marlins game. And, you know, the Marlins are down. All of a sudden, we, we see an in-park grand slam. Like, ridiculous game. Then the top of the fifth, this is where the story gets unique. Top of the fifth, I remember it was top of the fifth. Why? Because I'm hungry, right? So we've got our peanuts and Cracker Jacks, and I need my gluten and carbs. So. But I, we, hear the, we hear the crack of the bat. And I was telling Aiden, we're so close, you got to watch out what's going to happen. You never know where the ball's going to go. So we hear the crack of the bat. Go ahead. And now, what happened, right? It was like we time traveled. Well, what happened is, <laughs> is that the batter bat was up, hit a line drive, and it hit Kathy right in the eye. No. So if you guys have seen me this morning, I had my little arm brace on, my little chicken wing. So it all happened so fast, it was like slow motion. You hear it crack, and I'm like, no. But this arm should have went like this. But what it did was, eh. <laughs> and like I could see it, I'm like, uh, huh. And she was talking to her aunt and missed it, and was like, huh. And bam. And then she. Like, like, a, like straight like MMA, just turned around and went down and I got my chicken wing and I got my peanuts and I'm trying to hold it because you can't drop the chicken wings. And then we're in the, you know, fire rescue comes and of course I'm taking selfies. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to document this the whole way through. So this is where, then we get to the hospital. <laughs> now she can't see, she got the bandage all over her, her eyes and I'm just like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Next picture, and Ooh. right, ooh, sweet mother Buddha, right? Like, I mean, it just, it just split it just all the way across. Now, at this point, she has no pain meds or anything, and, uh, but she's a trooper, takes like a champ. She's still like, hey, what inning are we? Are we winning yet? And I'm like, what? <laughs> Next picture. So she's still in good spirits. I know she's not dying or dead. And I'm, we're taking these pictures, showing them to the boys. And I'm like, hey, mom's still good. And she's like, ah. I think she had the medicine at this point. I'm not quite sure yet. <laughs> Next picture. So this is the before. And at this point, she's got the, the medicine all in the eye. She can't feel anything. The guy was like cleaning it out. It was pretty gnarly. And it's the after picture. See, all nice and clean. So for Kathy, she just remembers the ball hit waiting in the hospital, and then it got fixed. Now, the hospital we went to was probably one of the best in Florida for head trauma. But what they failed to tell me is that it was in the hood. <laughs> and I don't mean like the hood of Stockbridge. I mean, I mean like the hood of Miami, not like Food Depot hood, like, like Food Liner hood. <laughs> and Food Liner is worse than Food Lion, for those of you who don't know. And so I get to listen to, I got a meth head over here, just carrying one of those octopus with the IVs, just like, I gotta go to the bathroom. And like, ma'am, you just went, go back in the room. I don't know where I'm at. And I got another lady over here <laughs> who says she can't breathe, but yet she's talking. She's, huh, huh, huh. I'm like, what is she doing? Is she hyperventilating? Somebody fix her. And then the doctors come over and they're like, uh, are you okay, ma'am? And she's like, huh, oh, I can't breathe. My throat hurts. Like, oh, now you can talk, but for four hours, it's, and then I got another guy across, just, ah, ah. I'm like, what is wrong with that guy? Oh, he's detoxing. 
No, you don't detox in the hospital. He's like, oh, they come here to get free food and free medical, and he just wanted a juice box. So here I am, I'm trying to be, you know, the man for Kathy, but I've got a meth head walking around trying to go to the bathroom in the corner of the floor. I got, ah, 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 out my eye, ah, where's the bathroom? And I'm like, oh, this is, I don't want to touch anything. So I'm like trying to bathe in Purell in the meantime, you know, those little hand sanitizers. So next week, so that's how our uh, Miami trip, but you can go to the next one. But all good uh, baseball stories have a happy ending. We got invited back. We got to meet Billy the Marlin. The kids are happy, and uh, we ate like kings because uh, they paid for it because they felt guilty for hitting a 90-mile-an-hour fastball in my wife's head. <laughs> so for me, it was great. I got free dinner. We got free baseballs. I mean, poor Kathy, she had a concussion, but, you know. I asked her, would you do it again if we could get VIP? And she said no, and I'm like, come on, be a team player, you know? <laughs> There's like 10 more games in the season here. <laughs> but, so that was our story <laughs> for our, my, our Miami story. <laughs> but this series, we've been talking about favorites. So they said, all right, Chandler, what's your favorite story in the Bible? And I'm like, well, we got all the, the random ones, and everyone's heard of, you know, you know, Moses built the ark, and really, nobody's going to call me out on that? Like, Noah built the ark. We got Adam and Eve and all that. I'm like, nah, what about? So we're going to talk about a, a, one of the stories I think is pretty cool. And the first bullet point is, I'm, we're going to get to the story. Don't worry about it. But the topic of it is the odds aren't in your favor. They aren't always. Why? Because this isn't Hunger Games, ladies and gentlemen. You're not going to win all the time. So the question I'm going to ask you is, when was the last time the odds weren't in your favor? Now, that could be a wide range. It could be when you came to 155 and tried to do a hot dog eating contest. It could be trying to pass a test you didn't study for. It could be eating a taco when on a road trip that you think is only going to last five minutes, but due to traffic becomes two hours. If you want to gamble with your intestinal Stuff like that, by all means. But just know, Taco Bell is always a gamble. <laughs> but, right? Mm. America. But tonight, we're going to talk about Gideon. Now, his name. Right? All the names and people and importance in the Bible, their names meant something. Gideon's name meant destroyer. Well, that's pretty pimp, right? I mean, the only destroyer I know is like Conan the destroyer. So Gideon the destroyer or Gideon is like the mighty warrior. So scholars, I did a little research, according to Wikipedia, and scholars maintain that Chandler comes from a Latin derivative meaning Chandler, which means one who doesn't tolerate gluten. So <laughs> it's wiki, so it's got to be the truth. Now, back to my man Gideon. He was a leader, but kind of one of those who really wasn't in a hurry to do so. Kind of like if I've asked you guys to be ultimate Frisbee or flag football captains. And I'm like, who, who wants to be a captain? Uh, right, okay, uh, Steven, you're a captain. Uh, okay, I'll do it. Like, you don't really want to, but since it got called out, you're like, okay, I'll do it. Well, so Gideon wasn't really in a hurry to be it, why? Because there's a huge backstory. So here's that, you know, that dream sequence, right? We're going to go back in time for the backstory of Gideon. Come on, Wayne's World, you guys got to get with me here. So, backstory here, here's Gideon, grown folk. Angel of God comes to him. I would, I think I would know an angel when I saw one, but apparently Gideon was a little apprehensive about it. So the angel says, hey, Gideon, I'm going to need you to lead an army. And he's like, uh, uh, pardon me? No joke, in the Bible it says, Gideon said, pardon me. I'm like, oh, okay. Pardon me, if the Lord is with us, why has all this bad stuff happened? How can I save Israel? Maybe it didn't sound like that, but in my head, when I'm reading, it's kind of fun to put accents with people. So he's like, wait, wait, I got it. Give me a sign. And, but hold up, angel, wait for me. So here's an angel, and Gideon's like, okay, cool, cool. So 
want me to lead an army, but uh, wait, wait right here, and I'm going to go make an offering for you and just, just stand here. So you're going to tell an angel to hold on a minute? So that's the angel's like, okay. So he goes, makes a sacrifice of a goat with like 46 pounds of like wheat, like just a, a gluten bomb. And then he sacrifices. So then the angel takes like a spear or like a staff, touches it. The meat just goes, right, like a gas fire. God accepted it. And Gideon's like, oh, you are a real angel of God. I'm like, well, so you doubt. So, so, so when you really think about that, like you doubted that was an angel, then if, now because a fireball happens, you believe it? Okay. So then God says, okay, now you've got your mission. I need you to do some other stuff for me. Everyone's worshiping false idols, false gods. And in particular, there's one called Baal. I'm going to need you to kill a seven-year-old bull from your father's herd. Okay, so modern terms, like, I'm going to need you to take your dad's restored Camaro and total it. <laughs> yeah. And Gideon's like, all right, cool. <laughs> so he kills the bull, and he goes, oh, but also that altar, that, that false fake altar your dad built, I'm going to need you to turn that down too. Okay. So he does it. And of course, everyone's like, oh, why did you do that? Uh, talking smack about him. And then they're like, you know what? We'll let Baal deal with him. We'll let the false god deal with him. We'll smite him down. Of course, nothing happens. And here's where Gideon says, or, he says again, all right, God, I got, I got it. You want me to lead an army? But I'm, just to make sure I'm the one you want me to lead an army, I need you to give me another sign. God's like, okay. He goes, so... I'm going to place some wool on the ground. We all know wool, very absorbent. And if it's, I'm going to place that at night. And if it's wet in the morning and the ground around it is dry, I'll know that's a sign. Wakes up in the morning, boom, he comes out, all the ground is dry, but the wool is wet. Picks it up, takes like a cereal bowl, squeezes it in it, water. He's like, all right, God, cool. But just to make sure, really, really, I'm the one to lead the army, I'm going to need you to do the opposite. I want the ground soaked, but the wool wet. But don't be mad, God. God don't dry. See? Work with me here, people. And God's like, you know, I'm not mad. Don't worry. I got it. So he does it. Ground's wet. Picks up the wool. It's completely dry. And he's like, okay. Okay. Now that I've got all the signs, I'm ready to lead this army. <laughs> but God told him, hey, you're going to lead this army, but it, you don't get home turf advantage. And for all the sports fans, if you don't have home turf advantage, it kind of stinks. So now he's got to go tell this army that, hey, yeah, we're going to go need to travel. A lot of you are probably going to die. <laughs> and all these false idols, you need to stop doing that. Who's with me? And then they're like, uh, mm, people are dragging their feet. So what Gideon had done this whole time, did he disobey God? No, I didn't really disobey, disobey him. He had to trust, but verify. So that should be your second fill-in. Trust, but verify. It's kind of like when your parents ask you if you've cleaned your room. Did you clean your room? Yeah. Okay, let me go check. It's not they don't believe you, per se. They just want to verify that. And there's, as you grow up and get jobs, you'll find out a lot of bosses will do that. They're like, hey, when you send that email, send me a copy. You don't trust I'm going to do it? Ah, I just need to verify you did it correctly. Ah, so pretty much you're micromanaging me. But for Gideon to trust but verify God, I mean, that took like, he had a lot of intestinal fortitude to do that. Because he asked him not once, but several times. Like, are you sure, God? Are you sure? To me, if God tells me to do something, I'm going to do it. At least I think I'm going to do it, like to the best of my ability. So he gets the green light. So he's got to lead like this whole army, nation of Israel, but he's already outnumbered. And I don't mean like, oh, it's like a one to two ratio. He's probably outnumbered like 10 to one. So God's like, all right, you're already outnumbered, but we got to trim the fat a little bit. So the Lord says to Gideon here in Judges 7, 2 through 3, 
The people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands. For Israel would become boastful, saying, My own power has delivered me. Now, therefore, come proclaim in hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. So basically, you got this general that's ready to lead an army. The Pentagon says, hey, you have too many. So ask, whoever's out there, if you're scared, say you're scared. People, oh, I'm scared. I ain't trying to die. So 22,000 <clears throat> people leave. 22,000. So now he's only left with 10,000. So now the odds are like if you're a gambler, probably, you know, like 50 to 1 odds that he's going to win this. Now, God said, hey, check it out. That's 10,000. But I can't give you a lot of people because then you're going to be like, oh, look what I did. I led the people. And the people are going to be like, it's our skill. You know, we're men. We can kill anyone. So to keep you humble, we have to take that 10,000 down more. Okay. So he's like, how, how many do we have to get to? He's like, well, let's go to a river and tell people to drink water. And then we'll weed it out. Now, in the Bible, it says they had some that kneeled down and some that lapped it up like a dog. Now, obviously, I'm guessing they're traveling. They don't have a lot of utensils. But why would God choose that? Well, I can imagine if I'm in a military set setting and someone tells me to drink water, if I go down like this and I go way down and I'm drinking water, I can't, I can't see my surroundings. But if I scoop it up, and they say lap like a dog, like this, I can, right here, I can see what's going on. So only 300 people did it the correct way. Watch, watch your surroundings. So then God said, okay, whoever went down and drank like they ain't got no home training, they got to go to. So 300 people are left. This kind of sounds like a movie, right? I think 300. There it is. But where this difference is, is that the other battle of 300, the whole Spartan movie, there was only 300 Spartans, but there was also 700 Thespians and 400 Thebans to guard the retreat. So they had still over 1,000. No, no, no. These people, bottom line, 300. Through it all, <laughs> Gideon's like, all right, God. All right, I mean, now we're like 200 to 1 odds. Do you even have a plan? Of course. God always has a plan. Right there, right there. Point number three. So God's plan was, I got to keep you guys humble. I'm going to be real with you guys. That's it. So here are, here are all these soldiers, 300 people, and what they did is they waited till shift change. How many people do shift work at their jobs? All right. and how many people don't know what shift work is? Okay. So what they did is, let's say they had an eight-hour guard duty. Well, at, at, when I first start guard duty, I'm awake. Like, hey, what's up? I'm, I'm looking out. I'm looking for things, you know. By hour eight, I've got like four rip it, you know, monsters and full throttles. And I'm like, okay, I don't care who comes here. Just, just hurry up and do something. And then your countdown to your relief comes. When your relief comes, they're like, hey, what happened? And you're like, ah, oh, nothing happened. You know, I just, oh, I'm so tired. You just, you got this. So right at that moment, that's when they made their attack. Now, how are 300 people going to make an attack on like, you know, one, one gigawatt people of soldiers? It's not going to happen. So what they did is they took a bunch of jars, they took torches, and they took trumpets and swords. So in the middle of the night, there's no lights on, there's no candles, no dinner, and they broke all the jars. So here I am sleeping. All of a sudden, I hear just breaking of, of pottery and glass all around. I'm like, well, what's going on? Then I hear trumpets blowing. You know, Just imagine like a, like a marching band from middle school all trying to hit the same note. That's what it kind of sounded like. So you're like, oh, I don't, they're not even in tune. What's going on? And then they start shouting, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. 
So now, remember, they've got like, let's say 500,000. Is it, I mean, it's hard to know how many people you have in your school, but you got 500,000 people at one base camp, in the middle of the night, all this is going on, you think you're being attacked? No one's, no one's turning on their flashlights or their smartphones. They're just running around in the dark. So if this is one army, and this is one army, one army, but we all work for the same people, but you don't know them, and then the alarm goes off, and you wake out of bed, and you run into her, and you're like, oh, you must be the enemy. Ah, dead. So now everyone just kills each other. And all the 300 are doing, they're just making noise, like, a, like 4th of July, New Year's Eve, and they're going nuts. And they're watching everyone down there running like chickens with their head cut off, killing each other. I would be laughing, too. I'd be like, oh, look at them now. They're killing it. <laughs> Fast forward, they win the battle. Now, that's faith. That's faith on a whole nother level. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'd like to think I had blind faith like that, but I don't know if I have. Like, God's basically stacking the deck against you. And when I say blind faith, I don't mean like I'm driving and I close my eyes and I'm like, God, oh, Jesus, take the wheel. No, I mean like, God, you, this is it. You take it all. It's hard to have faith like, faith like that. Not only, much less with God, but even your parents. When your parents are like, oh, trust me. But you're like, ah. Oh. But they don't really explain it. <laughs> Dad, why can't I get a tattoo? Why can't I pierce my ear? Why can't I gauge out my nostrils? You know? And they're like, oh, just, no, you don't want to do that. Trust me. No, oh, you don't know anything. But, but you can see your father, your mom, your grandparents, aunts, uncles. You can see that. You can't see God. So that, that faith, is, it, it's hard. And faith is just another word for trust. I mean, how many people trust more than 10 people? Seven. Five? Four, three, two, one. Okay, so everyone's got at least one person they trust. Okay. The hardest thing that I think I have to deal with, you know, you know, grown folk, pro old, old folk problems, is finances. It's hard to just turn that over to God. Just like, all right, God, I'm going to, like the pastor, this morning there was church here downstairs, and he was like, hey, you got to plant that seed. And I'm like, oh, but if I plant the seed, I don't have any money for my Red Bull. <laughs> and I'm not trying to eat seeds. I'm trying to drink Red Bull. <laughs> but you, sometimes you have to take that leap of faith. So the question is, what's holding you back from taking that leap of faith? From just giving it all to God? So some of the next steps on your card are, I will trust but verify not second guess. That's kind of like when your parents tell you to do something, you're going to trust them, you can verify it, but you're not going to be like, hey, uh, my parents told me to do this, but I'm going to go um, ask someone else what they think. Ah, that's kind of second guessing. That's not really verifying. Second is, I will ask advice from old school people and not Facebook polls. I don't know how many times I see on Facebook Facebook poll, should my parents allow me to drive at 17? I'm like, I, I don't know. If you're asking on Facebook, I'm going to say no. <laughs> don't ask me, ask your parents. Third, I want to be able to face any situation with God having my back. I mean, that'd be awesome. Just to walk into any situation, hypoth theoretically speaking, hypothetically, one of those like God would be this like seven foot, 280 pound bouncer, just have your back in any situation. Like you walk into a room and you just have peace because it's like, yeah, he's with me. That guy, he's with me. You had a party you're not supposed to be at and you're like, oh, how do I get out of here? Oh, hey, give me a ride home. So in, in your group tonight, there's gonna be a lot of questions that kind of allude to hurdles, faith, what I want you guys to do is go ahead and stand up. Bring it in. And we're going to pray. We're going to pray that 
you guys are just able to have that 100% turn it over faith like Gideon had, that when the odds are against you, when you think there's no way out, that no one's going to understand your situation, there's always one person that's going to understand. That's going to be God. It says, bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I think we will come here amongst friends and family and just relax, not worry about stress, drama, issues, and just being able to come here, worship in your name, and turn it over all to you. I ask that you just take this, all the burdens, emotional, physical, from these kids, and just give them a sense of peace and help them have that blind faith that Gideon had and to understand what trust but verify means. When you call, when, when we are given the call to do your work. In Jesus' name, amen.